have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Tiwari, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Cal State Fullerton. He did his PhD from Niigata University, it, that is in Japan, in 2003 in a postdoctoral study at Virginia Tech before uh, joining his current institution in 2006 as an assistant professor of civil engineering. His research interests include laboratory soil character characterization, physical modeling, geotechnical earthquake engineering, slope stability and stabilization, sustainability in engineering, natural hazard mitigation, and lightweight cellular concrete. Okay, he has supervised over 200 graduate and undergraduate students on their thesis, pro thesis or their projects. His research projects were funded by various sources, including the U.S. National Science Foundation, and those funding totaled over $1.6 million. He is an editor of several national and international technical publications. He, is also, he has also been an officer of several prestigious consortiums in engineering in institutions. He has received over 30 regional, national, and international awards for his contribution to professional societies pertinent to civil engineering, disaster management, and engineering education. He has delivered over 30 keynote and invited lectures, as well as short courses on various aspects of his research interests and current studies. He is a licensed professional engineer in California and is actively involved in geotechnical engineering consulting projects throughout the United States and internationally. Please welcome Dr. Binad Tiwari. Thank you, Janice, uh, uh, for a very kind introduction. <laughs> uh, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, you know, talk uh, to bring my uh, part of my research thing into uh, this venue and uh, tell you what I am doing and what uh, I could do or we could do collectively to uh, mitigate landslide hazards in Southern California. Uh, is this is this sound okay? So uh, the title I made is Causes and Effects of uh, Landslides and possible mitigation. So uh, as Sanis mentioned, uh, I'm Binod Tiwari. Uh, I'm a professor at, uh, in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department here at Cal State Fullerton. So uh, before I move forward, I, will, uh, I would like to tell you uh, my contribution uh, in the world of landslide community. So. Uh, you see, I'm civil engineer by profession, so my professional society is American Society of Civil Engineers. You know, civil engineering has six different branches, uh, like structural engineering, geotechnical engineering, uh, transportation engineering, water resources, all those. And I belong to geotechnical in engineering. So there is an institution, institute called Geo Institute. It publishes a journal, on a, geo a journal of geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering. Uh, and we cover a lot of landslide and slope stability uh, type of issues. This is the one among the best journals in the world for uh, landslides. So I'm associate editor of that journal. And International Consortium on Landslides is uh, uh, sponsored by UNESCO. Uh, and I, I am the vice president of the consortium. Uh, and there's a journal called Landslides. This is the only journal in the world that solely covers landslide hazards. Uh, and I am uh, uh, the executive editor of this journal. And we also do, every three years, we do a conference. Uh, we call World Landslide Forum. Last, uh, last one was in Slovenia. Uh, next one will be in, uh, in uh, Japan. And I'm trying to uh, bring the following one after three years, in 2023, uh, to USA. And bidding, it's a long bidding process, uh, to Cal State Fullerton, or maybe somewhere in Orange County. And there is another consortium called International Consortium for Geo Disaster Reduction. So landslides covers only landslides. But you see, when we talk about natural disasters, it's not only landslides. So you have flood, earthquake, uh, and tsunami. All those things are natural disasters. And International Consortium for Geo Disaster Reduction covers all those aspects. It has its own journal. I'm associate editor in chief of that journal. 
And the Council for Undergraduate Research is a big uh, uh, council in the U.S. Uh, for undergraduate research. Especially the school like Cal State Fullerton, we have a pride on involving undergrad students into research. Uh, and then those students are not only in being involved, they are bringing in tons of awards to campus to showcase Cal State Fullerton uh, into the, the national or international uh, you know, diaspora. So uh, from that light, and I'm proud to uh, <laughs> tell that I'm the, uh, the, the chair of engineering division of the council. Uh, and there is a journal published by counselor, uh, Council, and I'm one of the, uh, the editors of the journal. So today, I will, I will try to cover an entire one hour, 30 minutes. So I'll leave about 15 minutes for discussion, questions and answers. But I'll try to show you. It's not theory. I made it too general. That way, you know, uh, I'll tell you what happened in the world, and then what can happen and what are the processes, it will be like, this lecture will be like Landslides 101. <laughs> so I'll talk about natural disaster and the community. And then I'll talk about the loss due to landslides. You see, whenever we hear uh, I mean, uh, the, the weather forecast, oh, there will be rainfall tomorrow, right? And then I get a call, <laughs> say, OK, are we expecting more slides? So everyone is scared of more slides, especially our very expensive houses on the top of the hill. They, are, they have potential to have uh, landslides or more slide problem. So landslide problem is not only my, you see, if I have a house on top of the hill, if my house moves, then it's not only my problem. My house will hit someone's house. That's problem too. So landslides are very serious issues in not only in Southern California, all over the world. Uh, so I'll talk about that. I'll talk a little bit about what are the losses that we are bearing a year due to landslides globally. Uh, and then I'll try to teach you a uh, little landslide thing. So uh, what are the types of landslides? See, sometimes, you know, everything we, we, we get, we call them mod slide. And in reality, that's not mod slide. Right? So depending on the type of landslide, the consequences of the hazards are different. And then the amount of money that we are spending to prevent them are different too. So I'll toss a little bit on that. Uh, and then uh, I go more de in detail on the causes of the landslide. What, what triggers landslide? Right? And as you know, whenever we have rainfall, we are always scared of landslide. One is rainfall for sure. But there are a few more causes of landslides. Uh, then I'll show you a few examples of earthquake induced landslide because we are expecting we always tell i mean you, you, you might have seen uh, seen the drill we are doing every year multiple times with the expectation that hey we may end up getting i mean many of you have might have seen san andres uh, 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 the, the 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 movie right it is super exaggerated version of the earthquake uh, effect uh, but you see we're expecting earthquake we're not you know optimistic expecting that. We don't want earthquake, but earthquake is natural disaster. Rainfall, yes, we need rain, but we don't want rain that triggers landslides, right? It's a natural phenomenon. You cannot control nature, but by learning, uh, you know, uh, the statistical data, learning the processes, uh, then we, will, we can save ourselves from those disasters, right? So for that reason, I'll show you a few examples of uh, the landslides triggered by earthquake. And then I'll also show you a few examples triggered by rainfall. A, a great example that I brought today uh, was, depending on the venue I go, I changed the example for today. I chose Montecito, debris flow, a disaster that we, uh, we, we had last year, last January. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about a few Southern Californian uh, more slides. Uh, and then briefly I'll take uh, I mean, I'll take a few, uh, maybe five, ten minutes to tell what are the precautionary measures that we can take. Every year, uh, I mean, either family, friends, or the clients, sometimes, you know, people are scared when they have, I mean, recently I, I, I got contacted by one lady uh, in Santa Barbara, and uh, uh, her house uh, was in landslide area, and then uh, uh, the email said, oh, I'm losing uh, ten foot of my backyard in landslide. Can you come and help? Uh, you see, what I do is, I don't want to design because you see, design is, I have my license and I have stamp. 
Design is liability. So I don't want to design. What I do is I visit different places. Like sometimes my staff, you know, when you buy amazing three, three four million dollar house, two million dollar house on top of the mountain, then sometimes you see crack on that and you're scared. Wow, I got a crack. That may be landslide. I may lose my two million dollar uh, overnight, right? That's what people think. And then I get invitation. I, I get a call. For even my, my family friends, even people like that, the lady, uh, and I. I'm a professor. My job is not, you see, uh, to earn money and to, uh, um, yes, it's money. you need money for sure. But my first focus is to uh, help people by educating them. So what I do is I go to their houses and I tell them, you see, I am, I'm not designing. You, you find a, a consultant. I'm also a professional uh, you know, engineer, but I'm not designing for you. My job is more education. So I do consulting for the consultants, the high-level consultants, but not for the people. So I tell them these are the processes. You monitor the progress of your landslide yourself. So I train them. In 10 minutes, I train them uh, on how to uh, monitor the progress, how to figure out whether that is actually a landslide or uh, that's not a landslide at all. Uh, and then uh, I, I help them out. So I, I'll uh, talk a little bit about that today. Uh, and every year, at least three or four people I, I train. That's my objective to train at least five, uh, at most five a year. Uh, that way, those people will train the others. You just need ten dollar to uh, to buy tools to monitor them. Just Home Depot and ten dollars, you know. And you can go to other. I'm not advertising Home Depot here, right? So yeah, you can go to Lowe's anywhere, but ten dollars is enough. And then I'll summarize at the end uh, on what we should do to safeguard ourselves. There's no way we can change the the mother nature, right? So we can, there is no way we can change the amount of rainfall coming down to the earth. There is no way we can make a giant umbrella to cover the, uh, the Orange County. So what we need to do is we need to understand the consequences of the, the rainfall and earthquake and other natural disaster, and then try to avoid the problem. So we'll talk about that. So I'm not talking about structural device, you know, measures where to control, to design. That's different thing, a different venue. For this venue, again, I'm telling you, I'm trying to make it landslide 101 type of lecture. Okay. So let's start with the natural disaster. So there are few natural disasters that the world is facing every year, and every month, one or the other type of disaster is hitting the world, killing people, and then destroying millions of dollars of property. So one is earthquake, and nowadays, I mean, surprisingly for me, in past decade, we are hearing more larger scale earthquakes than in the past, more frequent. That could have been because of the, uh, of the you know, uh, the the media or social media we have, and whenever we get in, I mean, landslides or earthquake or those things, some part of the world, all of a sudden through the social media we see the impact, the the result of that right away on the video and everything, right? So, but earthquake is one among the, the worst natural disasters that we may want to have. And the landslide is another one that also kills uh, you know, hundreds of people a year, uh, millions of dollars of property uh, uh, globally. And the floods are, I mean, uh, are another. Whenever you have rainfall, uh, then that will trigger, I mean, risk, I mean, in the US, you know, we have been facing hurricane and Few weeks ago, a month ago, there were two big hurricanes that destroyed, uh, you know, uh, lots of properties and killed people in the U.S. So, hurricane, tornado. Uh, if you we go to uh, let's say uh, Asia, then it's a monsoon rain, or sometimes people call uh, the typhoon, and those things are killing people, and then that brings in flood. Uh, and the storm and hurricane, we talked about that, and then extreme weather. Sometimes you have extremely cold weather that kills people. Extremely hot weather that kills people uh, too. So uh, these are also natural disasters. And tsunami, tsunami is typically mostly tsunami is associated with earthquake. So when you have earthquake, uh, the epicenter at the ocean or water body, it doesn't need to be an ocean. It could be lake. Uh, then you have uh, the wave coming out to the surface. When the wave comes out to the surface, the amplitude of the wave increases significantly when it is coming to the surface because uh, the wave length, that is the length of one wave, decreases and amplitude increases. That creates tsunami. And then, oh, I'm sorry, again, I did a mistake. So wildfire is a one word, okay? So correct that. Wildfire is 
another one that we're facing. I mean, we're facing every year, uh, sometimes every moment in, in, in Southern California. So uh, that is another natural disaster. I would call, I would classify, FEMA classifies wildfire as a natural disaster. So for me, there's a gray zone to tell whether it's a natural disaster or anthropogenic or man-made disaster. So I would consider this semi-natural uh, disaster. And then volcanic eruption is another one uh, that causes significant damage to, uh, to the society, in, the, in the society. Uh, so today, we can separate them and we can have nine lectures for each disaster, but today I'm focusing on landslide only. So if you want to see the, the, the loss in the world uh, due, to, uh, due to a different type of natural disasters, it was compiled in 2014 when we had the uh, U.S., uh, you know, every decade, uh, the U.N. does, uh, United Nations uh, uh, does uh, a big conference. The 2014, there was a conference in, uh, in Japan, Tohoku. I was, fortunate I was part of the, it is on, for, on invitation only. You can go there to take part in the conference. So I was uh, fortunate uh, enough to get invited to that conference. And that, it, it has 30,000 people. Uh, starting from all, you know, uh, prime ministers, ministers from those countries, uh, to the, the working engineers. They compiled the data. You know, the, the good thing about that conference is, if you want to take part in the conference, then you have to submit a report of the natural disaster. And then re that report in the UN is public. And th from there you can see uh, the type of natural disasters and then, then uh, the loss due to those disasters in each country. And there, I mean, each report is maybe, 50, 60, 70 pages long. I compiled uh, uh, you know, the data from that report, and the left side you can see the frequency of the natural disaster, uh, middle is the death due to natural disaster, and the, the right side is the economic loss due to natural disaster. So this is the case of U UES, what you could see in the past, uh, from 1990 to 2014, so it's about 24 year data, then UES lose a lot of money uh, on the, uh, the death uh, due to a storm. So hurricane is one of the, uh, the storm that we are talking about, right? And still, you have to lose some money due to earthquake. And especially for uh, people, I mean, you might have faced many earthquakes in your life in, in California, starting from Loma Pierda earthquake, right? But the, the recent one we had was North Ridge in Southern California. And that did significant damage. That was one among the worst uh, you know, uh, the earthquakes in the world in terms of property damage. For that reason, you could see earthquake has about 9.1, 5.1 percent, uh, you know, economic loss out of all disasters. Okay, so one thing I want to tell you is storm, hurricane, and those things, frequency of that is that pretty frequent. You're expecting them every year, every two years, right? But earthquakes, you're not expecting them every year in the same location. So if you see the data, uh, same data in, in Japan, then you could see landslide, the blue one is landslide. So about 6% of the frequency of the number of land, uh, disasters is landslide. And unfortunately during that year, all economic loss and then the, the death toll was more by earthquake. Because in 2011, there was magnitude 9.1 earthquake in Japan that triggered tsunami and killed over 20,000 people. So that dominated all the statistics in Japan that time, otherwise landslide is significant. Even in that, during that incident, that event, about over 20 people died with landslide. Because 20, over 20,000 people died with tsunami, that people, 20, over 20 people dying with landslide was in shadow. So if you go to developing countries now, like India, I mean, I would consider India and China are now progressing towards uh, being developed country from developing country. Right? So if you look into the case in India, 8.5% of the incidences, natural disaster they're getting, uh, are due to landslides. Uh, and uh, they, they, do a lot of, they get a lot of property loss, but it is not listed here. But in, in China, uh, if you see, uh, for, unfortunately the color in the China is yellow for landslide. So in China, about 9% of the natural disasters they get is landslide. And they also lose significant amount of money with landslide. But if we talk about the, the damage we get from flood and earthquake, it is more significant than, than that with landslide. Okay? These are the data pertinent to uh, the natural disaster. 
Now, if we talk about the average loss per year uh, with those natural disasters, U.S. lose about three, 477 people a year and $104 billion of the property loss due to, land, due to the natural disaster. When it comes to Japan, in those years, that, the, that was the year I was talking about, those 24 years, Japan lost over 2,000 people per year, because mainly over 20,000 people uh, during the tsunami. 2011, uh, a big earthquake and tsunami, and then lost $132 billion of property loss. So it is significant, uh, right? And then countries like Nepal uh, lose over 200 people per year, this developing country, and lose only $0.3 billion per year, think about the GDP of that country versus the GDP of U.S. and Japan. So typically they lose a lot of, uh, if you normalize this loss with the GDP of the country, then th those developing countries stand way higher than the developed countries. Because developed countries have mechanism to rescue people. Developing countries, they don't have that mechanism. Then people get buried into landslides and they get buried forever. People can't even rescue them up. <coughs> I'll show you a few examples of that. So if you take landslide only, then the worldwide wide loss due to landslide is 600 people per year. Japan lose about $4 billion per year. Uh, and US lose about $1 to $3 billion per year and 25 to 50 people per year due to landslide only. And the Nepal lose over 300 uh, you know, people per year due to landslide and significant amount of property loss, but they did not quantify that in the report. So Italy and India, uh, both, uh, and China, all of them lose about one to two billion dollar of property due to landslides. Question? Yes. Who collects those statistics? You see, this is a very good question. The one previously I, I showed uh, on the natural disaster was based on the report each country submitted to UN. So I got that uh, number, that's the country. And then this data I have is all over the places. So I had to, for that reason I said, sources, various publications and blogs. So I had to look into different journals. If someone, let's say, uh, a, a person from Japan is publishing an article on landslide, they write, Lands Japan loses this much. For the US, US Geological Survey does that. So that way, different geological surveys from different countries, if you go to their web page, somehow these things are listed. Uh, and actual landslide loss has not been covered. Uh, I mean, sometimes you know the, the landslide loss. The countries cover the loss due to flood, loss due to earthquake, and they don't separate the loss due to landslide. So these losses are actually underestimated. In reality, we are losing more than what you can see here. And then, as you know, landslides, uh, the the landslide effect. Uh, Mostly transportation facilities. So you can see now, you see, when you're habituated, when you're used to amazing road network, and then you have only that road to go from one place to the other, and other than the traffic jam that we are facing every day in Southern California, uh, but you see, if you have that highway block with landslide, then this is not traffic jam. Maybe you wait for a while and it will be clear. But you, I mean, you, you heard the big sur landslide. And it took months, almost a, a year, to open the, uh, the Highway 1 because of the landslide, right? So most of the time, landslide affected the transportation facilities and definitely buildings and many other infrastructure like hydropower uh, and those stations, right? So once you have effect in transportation, then you hear that from media, right? Buildings may not be, but when there is a loss of people, then you hear that from media right away. So saying that, one statistic says that there were 2,620 federal landslides. Federal means landslide that killed people. That occurred between 2004 to 2010. And then during that period, 32,322 people died in the world. That's a lot, right? So, uh, and the, the distribution of that is like this. So on the right, uh, on, on your left, on your right, you can see Asia. So as you could see, uh, that Asia is affected more. But you see, the North and South America is also affected with the, the loss due to landslides. 
So if you want to see uh, the potential of landslide, that the, the dark red is the, the, the zone where we have very high incidence of landslide and high susceptibility of two landslides. And then you can see California has both. Northern California has more than the southern, but part of the southern California is also has both high incidences and high susceptibility to landslides. But the red one is the high incidences of landslides. So in, 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 in West Coast, you can see California and Oregon, more severe, uh, that has high susceptibility to landslides. And then if you go to uh, middle, sometimes Utah, Idaho, those area, the type of geology they have has strong potential to have landslides. And then they have a lot of rainfall. So they have very concentrated rainfall. And if we go to east coast, uh, east side of the country, like Appalachian Mountain area, and then those areas have a lot of landslides. So you could see uh, color-coded uh, landslide susceptibility and the landslide uh, you know, potential area uh, in, in the country. So one statistic says that in the US, we get 100,000 landslides per year. Wow, we didn't hear that in media all the time, right? That's mainly because if the landslide is occurring somewhere in nowhere where there is no people in the area, right? And then where the, no roads are blocked, no houses are damaged, then no one even cares about those landslides, right? Only uh, the researchers like me used to look into aerial photographs or satellite images and, and identify them for the research purpose. But it's the media is not attracted with that. But that is the statistics. So the good news in the US is we have a lot of land. So you see, if that happens in the land where people are not living, that is not throwing any risk. But think about countries like Japan, where they are, they are using almost 100% of their land for the settlement purpose. And then they have you know, one single landslide coming in will definitely affect the infrastructure or people. Right, so this is a very, I'm, I'm sorry for this little uh, low quality image of this photo. This is a map of the US, and then those uh, red color, uh, the, uh, the octagons that you can see there are the landslide in incidences in, in the US from 2007 to 2013. So the tons of landslides in the country between that and then throughout the country, and then you saw the incidences. So these are distributed to the area I showed you where a large, you know, high incidences of landslides. Okay, so among that, the size tells you the damage, right? And then, then damage to property, damage to uh, the I mean, death, death toll. And the, the black dot you can see there are the landslides that killed people. They're federal landslides, right? And then uh, you can see uh, the left top uh, corner, you could see also landslide there. So you might have recalled in 2014 in Washington, there was a big landslide, also landslide that killed uh, you know, over 40 people. Uh, and that was, uh, that was in media for months. Is the one thing I want to tell you is all these natural disasters. You see, when the disaster happens, then for a month, all those CNN, CBC, Fox, all news go, and then you hear them. After three to six months, you forget you had natural disaster in that area. And then we hit with those natural disasters. Then we, then we remember, oh, you know, five years ago, we had natural disaster here. We forget about that. So, so we should not forget it. Now let's, let me uh, uh, walk you through different types of landslides, okay? So not all landslides are called la mud slide. Uh, so one type of landslide is called a rotational slide. So this is big. <coughs> In this type of landslide, it, it does not happen all of a sudden. Most of the time, you have small landslides occurring uh, due to erosion or anything. And then it, if we don't control that, then every year, that become bigger and bigger and bigger, and then you get 30, 40, 50, 60 foot deep, large body of landslide. And you have seven, eight, nine, maybe 10, 20 houses in the landslide area. When the landslide moves, then house move with it. So it is very expensive to prevent these type of landslides. So what we do is, if you look into uh, the section, if you caught the landslide from the middle, you don't do that, but imagine, imagine, you know, just imagine that you're cutting, you're chop, chopping off the landslide from the mid, middle, 
then you can see the cross section from the side you can see this type of uh, the section and then here the base the, the red line you can see this is the, the depth of the sliding mass the soil below that is stable it will try to stop that landslide to move and the so soil above that is moving down right and the mass is pretty huge and then what triggers this is mostly water table you see below the ground we have water. Some locations you have water one foot below the ground. Some locations we have water hundred foot below the ground, depending on the you know local situation. But when you have slope, mostly water is maybe five, six, one to maybe six foot, ten foot below the ground, right? Higher, shallower the depth of the water from the ground, more potential you have landslide. So what rain does is rainfall. When rain falls on the slope. The rainwater from the from the soil percolates down or goes down, infiltrates down, and then when it hit that static water level, that will increase the water table. We call them water table, right? That increase that makes it closer to the ground. That triggers most of the time. That that triggers large scale rotational slides. So the reason we call them rotational is they slide like that. They rotate and slide. And the, the mass involved in these rotational slides are huge, sometimes you know, a million cubic yards of uh, the mass. So they are very expensive to control. The only way we can control them is not, by not letting them enlarge. So when you have small three or four foot uh, size uh, you know, a landslide or, or erosion, you control at that point. I'll give you one example of that. Uh, you see, uh, one of our technicians he has a house in Yerba Linda. And then, for some reason, you know, his sprinkler system did not work. And then, then you have the sprinkler totally broken, and then the, the sprinkler head came out, and the, the, the pressure of the water shot, right? And, and then you have a projectile type of water going to the backyard and eroded the soil. First, you think, oh, it eroded, that's fine. You don't even pay attention to that. And slowly, in three, four, five years, that eroded portion will start accumulating water there because you are pouring water in. You fix your, your sprinkler, everything is fine, but you are not doing anything in that small part. Then that water, sprinkler water, will go down and recharge the water table, and it flows from the soft surface. And then that increased the size of that tiny. It was one foot size uh, landslide in the beginning, and then every year it increased. By the time I was contacted, it was about three foot. Uh, long slide and, and then he was scared and said okay can you come and uh, help me out my staff I, it's my job to support right so I went there with my other technician and I told him okay it's a, if you don't fix it right now uh, then there will be a problem so he spent about five six three four thousand uh, dollar to fix to uh, put a wall and then uh, backfill that you know eroded portion then uh, now there's nothing. You can't even detect there was landslide in the past. So if you solve the problem right away, uh, then these type of landslides will not give you trouble. If you don't solve it, it will give you trouble. Good example of that is this. I don't know how many of you have been uh, driving in, per, in Rancho Palos Verde area. So this is Portuguese bend landslide. The, the famous Portuguese bend landslide where, you see, if one can develop this area, its house is multi-million dollar because it was in front. But you can develop houses there because it is a part of several acres of land is, hundreds of acres of land is under landslide. The whole mass is moving down towards the ocean. And if the speed is high, the depth is over 200 foot of the mass. If the speed is high, sometimes it moves by 29, 9, 29 30 inches per uh, Per year, meaning, so what people do, what they do, the city does, is they keep on resealing, and they, they keep on adding the, the asphalt or pavement to make the the the, uh, the road running from there. So this spectacular example of if you don't pay attention, there is no way you can get these type of landslides unless you have a big tectonic movement. But typically, you get smaller size, and then it from the toe it moves up to the crown of the landslide. So second type of landslide that we see frequently is called translational slide, like this. So the meaning of the translational slide is, you see, uh, you know, we are, we make your houses, our houses, we make our roads on soil, right? 
Some locations you have bedrock, very strong rock below the soil. Some locations you have very deep soil layer before you hit the rock, right? And then those layers, soils are actually, they are the weathered rock. So with the, the, the environmental processes, the rock weathers, and then converts into soil. And then you have a certain thickness of the maybe 5 foot, 10 foot, 15 foot thick soil layer on top of very strong rock layer. Then now you can see very weak soil layer, very strong rock layer. When you have rainfall coming in, that rainwater goes down, and after it <coughs> hits the rock, then there is no way that rain, rainwater percolates down from the rock. Then it starts accumulating there, and then it starts moving even from the contact between the, the weathered soil and the bedrock. And then whole slide, whole soil, weathered soil will start sliding down. And we call that type of uh, the, the landslide is translational slide because it's way longer compared to the thickness of the slide. So we get a lot of landslides during heavy rainfall and uh, the uh, translational landslide during heavy rainfall and during earthquake. Because when you have earthquake, the contact between that strong bedrock and the soil is weak and then it is shaking at that contact and then soil falls down. <coughs> so scale-wise, it's not as large as the rotational slide. So there is a, a strong possibility that we can clear that within a day or two. But if we talk about rotational slide, big star lands are one example of that. So if you have big rotational slide, there is no way you can, you can uh, just you know, control the landslide by taking the materials out. The other type of landslide is more involved with the rock as opposed to soil. So it is a block slide. So sometimes when you have, you see, very weak soil, weak rock, and strong rock. So do, how the rock is formed, especially for the sedimentary type of rock, in, in, uh, we, we, we get in when the river is very strong, that it can bring in uh, gravel, sand, all the big boulders with it. I would say sand, let's say, with it. And then it can deposit somewhere, right? And then when the river is weak, then it cannot bring sand in those boulders. It can still bring some, uh, let's say, soil fine grain like clay, <coughs> marts, those type of things, deposit. So now we have alternate deposit of sand and uh, the clays, right? And the, the, the fine materials. So those clays you have, marts you have, are very weak. And with time, let's say after thousands of years, millions of years, and then that soil become rock with the pressure. It keeps on accumulating. And then sandstone is strong. Clay is very weak. Then what happens, marts stone is very weak. Shale we have here in the, in the U.S. is very weak. And then what happens is when water penetrates there, it cracks and water penetrates there, there it will weather that at the surface and then the surface is very weak and the mass of the rock above that slide down. Okay, so it could happen due to heavy rainfall, it could happen during earthquake. Most of the time you get these type of landslides during heavy rainfall or earthquake. But the big mass chunk of the soil uh, rock will fall down like this and block the road. And rock falls are common when you have earthquake. Then what happens is the loose rock, you can see if you drive to Santa Barbara, you can drive to, uh, in, uh, in, uh, to uh, San Diego, all those slopes, uh, you can see rock fragments, rock pieces there. So those rocks, when you have earthquake shaking, those rocks fall down. The size is not big, but that will block the road, that may hit the back of the building uh, like that and that will cause damage to, and, and then the unfortunate, if, you, if the incident is unfortunate, I have seen that incident, the car was going, and then a rock fell down and hit the car, and then you, you, you expect fatality with that, otherwise it's typical not to get a huge amount of fatality with rock falls like that. So the prevention of that rock fall is, most of the time what we do is, if you see loose rock, then you go there with the, with the, the, uh, the, uh, the wire net, we call them gavian, gavian net, and then we fix them where that, like containing those rocks on the slope. That's one of the, the techniques. Or sometimes we just pour concrete in, we got, call that short crit, and then we just nail a few loose rocks and then cover them with the short crit. Uh, that, those are techniques to control them. And topple is another phenomena we see like that. If you have vertical rock joint, you see, uh, then uh, personally we don't have that, but if we go to East Coast, if you have a joint and the water penetrates inside, let's say that joint in New York, somewhere upstate New York, uh, then that water freezes during uh, uh, the winter season, right? When water freezes, the volume of the water, volume increases. 
And then when the volume increases, it pushes the rock mass. And when the, the, uh, in, the, in the dry season that water thaws, uh, then volume decreases, that water drains out, now you have a nice separation. The size of the crack keep on increasing with time, and then that will cause uh, landslide. You call that topple. Lateral spread is another interesting phenomenon. So what happens is, like in Fullerton, if you dig uh, maybe a few meters, few foot, maybe 50, 60, 70, 100 foot, below that we have very loose sand layer. If that very loose sand, sand is below the water table, and we call that, you see that sand, loose sand has potential to liquefy, that means convert into liquid when you have earthquake. Because when you have earthquake, earthquake will hit water. You know water, when you hit, when any force hit water, water will give pressure everywhere. So it gives pressure up also. And then that soil totally, con that sand totally converts into liquid. So it doesn't have strength at all. And then when you have, you, if that slope, even though it's very gentle, it's a flat, but if you have some creek at the end, and then if that layer of loose sand is, is collected to the creek, then that liquefied layer acts as a water, then the whole thing will slide down towards the creek. So a lot of cases I have seen the abutment of those bridges, the approach road of the bridges, approach wall of the bridges, collapse along with that, uh, the, the force, that landslide. We call that lateral spread. And a lot of time in Southern California, we see mudslide, right? For me, it is not mudslide, I call it debris flow. For the debris flow to happen, you need to have a source. Right, very steep slope somewhere, and rainfall is enough to trigger the debris. And the, once the, that, that mass is triggered, then it flows down like that, and then the water penetrates down, if there's a boulder there, then water will penetrate at the contact between the boulder and the soil, and then slide this boulder down. And then when that mass comes down, it starts with small sources, when the whole debris falls down, that it can carry anything from both sides of the creek and then become bigger and bigger and bigger and cause extensive damage uh, to the downslope side, downhill side. So uh, this is the example of debris flow. It starts from the creek mostly or, or the hill. And then you can see this, uh, uh, the upper picture you, you see here, you see it was debris flow. Did you see that two layers? It is called debris fan, the rainfall and landslide so when you have rainfall landslide in the creek or stream, landslide occurred from both sides that will block the creek. And then water level will go up, right? And then at some point that will overtop the dam, natural dam, and that will completely bre breach the dam. We call that natural dam breach breaching or landslide dam breaching. And the whole debris must come down and then when it comes out, then it make debris fan. It's amazing thing. Look like amazing because after a year you get visitation in a nice, nice flat area and then people start building houses there uh, and doing cultivation, do all, all sort of things. And then after typically after 15 years, this cycle repeats. So after, you can see two layers. One, the, the white one you see uh, was triggered 15 years after the one you could see nice, uh, the, the farmland there, right? So, and this is another example where you see that there, there was a breeze about 50 foot below this debris mass. So debris mass is 50 foot tall, and they could not rescue the bridge, so they made culvert on top of the debris mass. So this is typical. Good example of that, in, in 2014 in Hiroshima, uh, over 70 people died uh, with the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, mud slide or debris flow. So it started from the, the, the uphill somewhere, and then when it mixed with a lot of water, then the, the soil converts into a liquid, a fluid. And then it comes down and bury uh, people, uh, and bury the buildings and kill people. Uh, so even in Japan. So this simple technique to calculate how much volume you can get, uh, you don't need to go into detail on that, but you see the numerator has amount of rainfall and the surface roughness. Uh, and then bottom part has visitors in depth. So the reason I brought this is, if you lose visitation cover, how do we do that? Overgrazing will lose visitation cover in Southern California. Either we are just, I mean, killing the, uh, we are just cutting the trees. Typically we don't do that, but mostly we lose visitation cover on the slope due to wildfire. And then when you have a visitation cover loss, then you get huge amount of debris coming down. 
So Devry Ambulance is a little bigger version of Devry Flow. I'll tell you the story of this. This, this happened in 2015 after the, the Nepal earthquake, Gorkha earthquake in Nepal. You see, it's Himalaya, so a high altitude. This place is about uh, uh, seven or 8,000 foot above the sea level. And then about, about three miles, no, it's about two and a half miles, a little bit different, that high. The debris mass, you see the, the loose soil was, it is Himalaya, so it had ice lenses in the soil. When you had big earthquake, the soil dislodged from the three, uh, almost, uh, it's about three and a half kilometer up. So about uh, two and, or two and a half miles up, and then the whole thing came down and collected all the loose debris with this, with it, and when it came to ground, like that. So it blocked the river, it buried 300 people under it. And the force was so high that the ear burned, that the pressure of the ear was so high uh, that all trees toppled down. And then when it went to the side, all buildings on the sides completely toppled down because of the huge ear force, right? This is about, I estimated that to be about 5 million meter cube of debris mass. Uh, and then still they couldn't rescue people. I mean, over 200 people are still I think it's total 230 people is under debris still now. And many of them were visitors because Himalaya, a lot of you know, uh, mountaineers and uh, the foreign people uh, were there. They are residing there. They, are, uh, they were just uh, staying there that night and the earthquake occurred and debris avalanche come. So we call these type of large scale debris fall, flow are debris avalanche. Now let's move into uh, the triggers of landslide. Okay, so definitely one of the largest trigger of landslide is intense rainfall, heavy rainfall, right? And the second one is uh, the rapid snow melt, especially for those rotational uh, slides, big scale slides in, in the wet season, in, in, the, in the dry season, the snow melts, right? And then slowly that melted water goes down and recharge the water table. And that triggers landslide. And then uh, the water level change and coastal evolution. So I personally prefer to uh, talk a lot on the coastal evolution because we are living in the coastal area and we have seen many landslides in the coastal area. Uh, and then another uh, trigger of the landslide is volcanic eruption. We'll talk about that. And then the earthquake is another major trigger of landslides, but the scale of the landslide triggered by earthquake and rainfall will be different. I'll talk about that. And then anth anthropogenic causes. I put wildfire as anthropogenic causes here because I personally think that, uh, you see, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, although it is in the gray zone, uh, I, I prefer to put that in anthropogenic. That way, to alert people that we trigger wildfire and then we trigger landslides. And then faulty construction of infra infrastructure. Throughout the world, uh, I have done consulting and I have seen people, I have seen those landslides, big landslides triggered because we did not pay attention to old landslides and developed our houses, our infrastructure, including bridges or water mains, everything from the landslide area. And deforestation, deforestation is another example of the, what deforestation does is when you have forest cover, so uh, then that forest cover will perceive, will, will intercept the rainwater. So you will not let the rainwater go down and recharge the water table. Plus it will re reduce the soil erosion problem. Right, but when that cover is gone, and plus vegetation, vegetation will somehow cover reinforcement to the soil. That will stop shallow landslides. Uh, but when you, we do uh, deforestation, then we will lose that. So I don't want to call it a cause, but there are so many, uh, you know, uh, the, the theories involved after the Oslo landslide. Some people wrote in the journal. Some people wrote even even file lawsuits. All those things. Some people wrote, wrote that the cause of the landslide. Uh, was uh, the, the, the deforestation. You know, when you are doing logging, timber logging, then you have to be careful whether that timber logging is affecting, uh, it triggering the landslide or not. I don't know whether that is the cause of the landslide because I did not do investigation on that, but some people in the media, they said because of the timber logging, that big also landslide occurred. But you know, it doesn't occur that all of a sudden because that's a large scale landslide. I'll talk about that. You see, deforestation is definitely a cause of a uh, landslide. And then sometimes when we do mining, it could be stone mining, it could be copper mining, it could be gold mining. So when we are doing mining activity on slopes, 
then if we don't pay attention to protect the slope after we do mining, then we trigger, uh, that trigger landslide. And rice cultivation, you see, a lot of places, when we cultivate rice or paddy, uh, then it requires to inundate water for long, two, three months, you have to, uh, you know, have water there continuously. And if you have a crack, you need to have impermeable layer on the slope. So most of the time what people do in Japan, countries like Japan, they produce very you know, delicious rice and they cover, they make terraces and then they cover the base of the terrace with clay, very impermeable type of clay with the assumption that that will stop the water from percolating down, right? And then somehow if that clay, clay get desiccated or cracked, then the water percolates down from that crack and retard the water table and increase the uh, water table, and then that will cause landslide. So uh, if we are cultivating uh, the rice on slopes, first, we should not do that. Second, if we need to do that, then we need to protect the base of that, uh, the paddy field. Uh, and then most of the time, what I have seen is landslide occurs due to poor water management. So if you look into the Google Earth images, or Google image of the Southern California, a lot of slopes, you can see drains, right? French drains. And you can see even in the Google image that if you are managing, you're draining the water out uh, you know, in a nicer way to the creek, then you avoid the landslide problem. But if you let the slope be there, and then uh, the water falls down, and then that will start erosion, that will trigger landslide. You can see those type of real uh, type of uh, soil erosion. If you drive in Highway 57 north to Pomona, few locations you can see when you have rainfall you can see those uh, soil erosion problems and then again i'm telling you landslide is a little exaggerated version of soil erosion if you don't control the soil erosion right away then that will convert into big landslide okay and then uh, that is poor water management so if i would make those slopes i would make drains nicely to drain the, the rainwater out safely towards the creek uh, then the last one, uh, but not the least I have, is improper farming practices. So there is a controversy on that. People think that, hey, you know, when cattle are growing, uh, uh, cattle are, uh, you know, grazing, then they will uh, they make the ground stiff. Uh, that is minor. But most of the time, uh, you see, if you, you are, you know, on, on man, you are not managing the growing, uh, the grazing practice. If you're, if you're overgrazing the vegetation cover with the cattle, then that will open the ground to rainfall and soil erosion. That will cause landslide. Okay, now let's look into them one by one. Intense rainfall. So, x-axis I have. You see, the worst thing during rainfall is the heavy rainfall, right? But if the heavy rainfall comes, very very concentrated rainfall, we call that intensity. How many inches of rainfall you're getting? per hour, how many inches of rainfall you're getting per minute, like that, right? Typically, the scale of the intensity is how many in inches of rain you're getting, how many millimeters of the rain you're getting per hour. That's the intensity. And then, how long you're getting that. So, there's a combination between intensity and duration, because if you multiply the intensity with duration, that'll give you total amount of rainfall you're getting in the area, right? And look into this graph. So, I'll go with the top, you can see China there, so I color coded the blue is China and then the graph is blue, right? Let's focus on US. So typically these graphs tells you the envelope. If the intensity and duration is plotted above the envelope, you are getting landslide. If it is below that, you are not getting landslide. That is statistical. So in Santa Cruz Mountain, you can see in the US, that that is pretty close to the envelope, you are getting intensity, duration set you're getting from Hong Kong, Japan, China, and all those places, right? And then some part of the U.S., I thought it was Appalachian Mountain, uh, then it is lower. So you need, you get landslide right away uh, with less intensity and less duration of the rainfall. Uh, but you see, the Santa Cruz was a little stronger, okay? So now I'll show you, and then if you look one way below that, right? So the, the lowest one you see, it is for the wildfire. So if your vegetation cover, I'll tell you, I'll show you an example. Let's say there is a rainfall for the period of, uh, it's in log scale, so 30 minutes. 
So this period, this duration is uh, half an hour. If you get a rainfall for half, half an hour to trigger a landslide in the, uh, this, these are the, the, the resources. In typically, let's say in Santa Cruz Mountain, based on the data, if you have half an hour rainfall, then the intensity of that rainfall should be about 20 millimeter per hour. Okay, divide that with 25 uh, to get in inches. Uh, so it's about uh, 0.8 inches uh, per hour in Santa Cruz Mountain. Then the other cases in, in let's say Appalachian Mountain somewhere that it requires about uh, uh, up about is one uh, about five millimeter uh, per hour, right? If it is 30 minute duration, then when it comes to wildfire area, it requires only four millimeter per hour. So that way, you see, the amount of the intensity of rainfall required per, uh, per hour for the same duration is less to trigger landslide, is less you have the, 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 the ground slope open by wildfire. So when we talk about a Monte Zero landslide, I'll show you uh, how this chart can be easily used to see whether the intensity and duration of the rainfall that they had in Montecito area was good enough to trigger every flow or landslide or not. Okay, this is rainfall. So in our lab, what we did was we found the intensity of rainfall. What happens is when you have heavy rainfall, that rainwater will percolate down under the ground. So depending on the intensity of rainfall, uh, then the, the speed of the water going under the ground changes. So higher the intensity, higher the speed, right? You can calculate that using uh, this chart. I'm not focusing on that. And then because of that, water table will recharge sometimes. Sometimes, you know, it even slides down before the water table recharges. If the ground is now heavy with rainfall, uh, rainwater, and then two or three, uh, five, six foot uh, soil will slide down with that heavy rainfall. But this is famous landslide in La Conchita. Have you heard of that La Conchita landslide? It is in uh, Highway 101 uh, from Santa Barbara. Uh, yeah, I think in between Santa Barbara and Santa Sobis Paul. So you see, it happened in 2000, 2005. 2005 was bad year for Southern California. There are two big landslides occurred. One was La Conchita landslide. In 99, you know, North Ridge earthquake occurred in 1994. So when you have Earthquake shaking, the slopes are loosened with the earthquake shaking. In 1995, there was big rainfall. And then that triggered landslide in La Conchita area. Okay? Then people thought, okay, and then after six months, I told you, this is the memory of the people. And then it, it came to media and people slept. They didn't do anything. And I'm telling you, 10 to 15 years is a return period of the rainfall that triggered landslide. So 1995, so I was expecting the similar amount of unprecedented rainfall in 2005. And then in 2005, there was unprecedented rainfall in Southern California, and that triggered this landslide even larger, that did significant damage, that damaged, damaged several buildings, and, this is, and there are a few <laughs> lawsuits involved uh, on that. And at the same time, in our backyard, uh, in the uh, city of uh, uh, Laguna Hills, there was Bluebird Canyon landslide. So in the same year, what happened was uh, in 1995, we had few landslide incidents. In 1995, we had few landslide incidences in Southern California. It was mainly because after the earthquake, we got big rainfall. And 10 years after that, again, in, in, in Orange County, Bluebird Canyon landslide triggered down. And the good news about that landslide, the city acted so quickly, so nicely, that they evacuated people. Uh, and then they requested FEMA to support them. And then the whole soil involved in the landslide were taken out. And then they, they co completely controlled the, the landslide, re regraded the soil, and then put few engineering structures, and then built those houses there that they, was damaged with the, uh, the, the landslide and returned the people back. There was not a single uh, you know, lawsuit incident I heard uh, from this. So some places are like that. City played amazing role to stabilize the landslide area. So you see, uh, after 20, 2005, 2015 would be the year, right? 15, 16 would be the year where we, 2014, we had a lot of rainfall in Southern California, but that area was fine. 
So from that point of view, I'm telling you, 10 to 15 years is a return period of heavy rainfall. And then you could expect a lot of landslides. Like this is another example in 2014 in Oso area, in Oso of Washington, it's about an hour uh, drive from uh, Seattle, a big landslide occurred and the whole mass came down and then buried the river and then it whole after, you know, it, it buried the river, in under the river, even the mass was so big that it, it, it even flew uh, uh, towards the settlement you have in the opposite side of the river. And then that uh, buried over 40 buildings and completely, completely damaged over 40 buildings, killed over 40 people, and that was a big thing in the media. And then what people think, could you see the vegetation here in the area? If you look into the photograph, you see, on some part of them, they don't have vegetation cover, right? But the thing is, these type of big landslides don't occur all of a sudden. They were small. If you look into that area, I went there as a part of ASC team, American Society of Civil Engineers team. And then few creeks in the map prepared in 19, 1910 or 1920, they had mod slide creek or something like that. So this area is famous for landslides, but we were not paying attention to, uh, uh, to the possible movement of those uh, landslides. And this is a close view picture I, I took uh, when I was there. So, so these things happen in sequence. It doesn't happen all of a sudden, right? So this is the recent one uh, in India. There was a big flood in India, uh, and uh, then uh, when you have big flood, big rainfall, you get the big flood, that rainfall was uh, triggered this landslide. You see, the thing is, the reason I brought it up is, did you see the color of the soil here? It's a red soil. So almost 30% of the China has red soil. And you might have heard, a lot of landslide incidences after rainfall in China. That was mainly because they have a red soil like this, and it gets this, it reduces its strength significantly during a rainfall, and then it triggers landslide like this. They are big landslides. The worst consequence of landslide uh, is rainfall in this landslide is landslide dam. So in 1980s, it's, I think it was 83, in Utah, that this is called fissile landslide. So there was a railroad, there was a, a railroad, uh, uh, you know, in the upstream, uh, you know, like uh, up, up hill side of the, the creek. And then there was a big rainfall and then a huge snow melt that triggered the entire mountain down, blocked the river. And that was the first federally declared emergency in Utah. So federal guard FEMA helped them and then you see, a, a, it, it was very long, about 300, 200 to 300 foot, uh, the water was you know, uh, inundated. And then there are few settlements there. N no one died, but the, the people lost, I mean, about $900 million in today's currency value uh, that they evacuated. So fortunately, they made a tunnel at the base of the, uh, the, the dam and they cleared the area. The, 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 it did not exaggerate the problem. The worst thing would be when the water keeps on inundating, that water will overtop the dam and the entire dam, you know, uh, breaches. That can sweep away, you know, but maybe five, six, seven towns at the downstream side of the river. But that didn't happen. But it was one among the largest disasters in the country. Like this dam. If you have been to Italy, it's about an hour drive from Florence. It's called the violent landslide. So there's a a place called Vion Dam. They made amazing dam, uh, it's a concrete dam, right? But what happens is when you are making dam, then you are inundating water level, right? Because dam means you are you're ponding water. Then because you because you're ponding water, level of the water in the slope will go up, and the slope might have been marginally stable. Then because water level goes up, you get landslide coming down. So same thing happened. The whole mountain slid down before even they inaugurated the dam. The mountains lay down, and then that created artificial tsunami of maybe 100 to about 200 meter high tsunami uh, of the water. And then that overtopped the dam, that's a flood, that flood washed away nine villages and killed over 2,000 people. So when we're making dam, we have to be extra careful in making sure that the, the mountains are not sliding down. There's, there's another incident where hundreds of people died so they had big rainfall, and then the, uh, in Nepal, uh, then uh, landslide came down, the whole mass slid down, and then blocked the river and killed over 100 people. 
uh, with that. And then they buried hundreds of houses and even a few hydropower uh, uh, you know, stations. Uh, one of the hydropower stations, fortunately, it was at the downstream side of the dam and it was set. So sometimes you, know, you get big landslide dam and then block the river and then you have a nice uh, you know, uh, dam created by landslide. It didn't overtop, so now, now you have a nice flat plain where you can even uh, you know, uh, use boating. It's like a lake. So you can see these type of landslide lakes all over the world, especially Europe. If the river current is strong enough, then even though you have big landslide mass coming down, it will not block the river. So it depends on how big mass coming down and how, how strong is the current of the river. Ra rapid snow melt. So if you have snow melt like this and the water level, then snow melt, the water is going under the ground, that will resolve the water table, that will trigger landslide. So water level changes. So uh, if the water level goes up, that triggers landslide. Water level goes down. So typically, that change ranges from about seven, eight foot seasonally. But you have to be very careful to check. If you are in slope, you have to be careful to check how the water level is changing with rainfall. This is important. Coastal evolution. So in 2012, I don't know whether you have heard that or not. Is if you drive from from uh, Tijuana in Highway One, same highway to Ensenada, uh, and then whole area has tons of, I mean, uh, a, lot, a lot of landslides, which are similar to the Portuguese Bend landslide. So what happens during, it's like that, you see, it's a beautiful view, but a lot of area, they have uh, many landslides. And this happened, the, the one on the right, you can see, all of a sudden, roads slid down. That was with a combination of small amount of rainfall and the small earthquake. So they had about 3.4, 3.5 magnitude earthquake, and they had rainfall. And the combination of those factors triggered that landslide. Right? But what I would say here is it's not only that. When you have coastal area, like this Portuguese Bend landslide, when you have coastal area in our type of geology where you have very expansive type of soil, what happens is when that soil is you know, created in the coastal area, it has salt. Because the water is saline water, it has salt in it, in the water. So that salt water will make the strength of the soil very high. I'll show you an example we have. So I'm um, same thing in, in, in the coastal area. This big sur landslide was in the coastal area too. So what happens during uh, uh, the, uh, in the coastal area, this big sur landslide happened uh, a, few, I mean, a year or two ago. And I looked into the aerial photograph of that uh, area. Whole area has typical landslide topographs. So big sur collapsed and caused damage. Now still, I don't think the road is They were planning to open the road last, last month. I don't know whether it's opened or not. For a month, that Highway 1 was closed, right? That's mainly because what happens is the type of rock we have is like that. It is very expansive. When it, the soil mixed with saline water, what happens is this. You see, x-axis, I have the strength of the soil with saline water. Y-axis, I have the strength of the soil when that salt content is leased out and you have the fresh water in contact with that saline water. So if that effect of the salt is gone, it happens with time. Uh, then, you see, the strength was, let's say, 25 at the scale of something. And when this, it is, the salt it has in the soil is leased by coming in contact with the fresh water, then its strength drops to 10. So it's one scale we call friction angle. Don't worry about that. So scale is 25. Strength was 25 in one scale. When you have crack and the fresh water will percolate down from the landslide area, a landslide mass, and then that salt is leased out, then strength keeps on dropping. It drops by two and a half times. And we have a lot of potential to have Big Sur or Portuguese Bend uh, or the Ensenada type of Highway 1 type of landslides uh, in the community. Uh, and then uh, the earthquake will definitely trigger, right? So volcanic eruption, when volcano is erupting up, this is one I took in 2000 uh, in Japan. So when volcano is erupting up, it does two bad things. One, the flat area converts into slope. Because when the magma is coming out, it changes the topography, right? The other thing is when the magma is coming out in the form of lava, then all the volcanic ashes get deposited somewhere. Now it's a loose deposit of volcanic ash, with time, that loose deposit of volcanic ash converts into soil and converts into slope. And this is so weak that when you have rainfall, the whole volcanic ash slides down uh, in the form of debris flow or landslide. 
And earthquakes are one among the triggers. But what earthquake does, earthquake never trigger fresh large size landslides. The size of the landslide triggered by earthquakes are pretty small. Let's say 1,000 square, square foot uh, area or 100 square meter type of uh, landslide. So if you look into x-axis, I have the ground acceleration. That is similar to the, uh, the magnitude. So higher the magnitude and y-axis, I have the number of landslides. So higher the magnitude and higher the, higher the ground shaking that triggered by the earthquake, more number of landslides were expected. So saying that in, in, in Nepal, in 2015, uh, uh, the Nepal earthquake triggered over 15,000 landslides, magnitude of 7.8. So if you look into the graph here, x-axis in the, uh, the left down graph, the area of the landslide, y-axis the number of landslides. So significant, the, the, the maximum number of landslides were concentrated with the area less than about 2,000 square meter. So earthquake will not trigger large size landslides. That will trigger small size landslides. It's easy to trigger small size landslides. So uh, then it's easy. And then for the problem is once a small size landslide is triggered, if we don't pay attention to them, that will convert into large size landslide. Right? So recently there was a big uh, earthquake in, uh, in, in Japan. Hokkaido area, and that earthquake triggered landslides like that. So that's mainly, you know, Hokkaido is in volcanic area. In volcanic area, you have volcanic ash, and then when that volcanic ash comes in contact with uh, uh, water, or sometimes you, know, you have water, the ground saturated with water because it, it was after the rainy season, and then you have earthquake, then you have a large run out type of uh, landslides. So what we did, we found in our lab, we did research with our students, we put, we simulated the landslide situation, there's actual soil from one landslide area in Southern California, in Mission Bayo, and then we put that, and then we apply rainfall like that, different intensity, different duration, and we also put that in our table to simulate earthquake. So we apply rainfall and shake it with the earthquake, and sometimes we just shake it with the earthquake and apply rainfall, different amount of rainfall afterwards to see the effect of landsliding. So what we found is, up to certain density of the soil, right? The, during earthquake, the soil will become denser with the earthquake shaking, and then landslide doesn't occur. It settles a little bit, but landslide doesn't occur. But when you have uh, the very dense soil with earthquake shaking, the soil cracks, and then that crack is enough to trigger land, to, to percolate the water down and trigger landslide. That's what we found in our lab with my students. Again, I'm telling you anthropogenic causes, uh, causes. One is wildfire. This is a picture from Montecito area. You could see after the, this is before the wildfire. Thomas fire, you must, ha you must have heard, right? So Thomas fire. So this is before the wildfire. You could see visitation. You can see very narrow creek there, right? After the wildfire. You see the all visitors covers are gone. And these are the size of the creek now. <coughs> the creek is full of debris. Uh, and that debris is still there. I'm worried if we don't do something, that debris mass will slide down again, cause even severe damage to the society. There are so many very expensive houses in the area. So this is uh, the example of few wildfires we have. So what I would do is, when we have wildfire, uh, if I, <laughs> I have enormous amount of uh, money and, uh, and the resources, I would monitor those slopes and check whether we can uh, you know, prevent the, uh, the loss of property and people, or at least you, whether we can evacuate the people from there or not, right? So there's a map of Southern California where the, the red one you can see is the area affected by earthquake, wildfire, and rainfall. So those areas are very vulnerable to a landsliding during earthquake. Like faulty construction, if you're making your irrigation structure or anything, online irrigation uh, channel in the landslide area, that will trigger more land. So if you're expecting uh, old landslide and you have to pass the, uh, the, the, let's say, water main, irrigation, anything, you have to make sure that you are controlling landslide before you even plan the, uh, the infrastructure. You might have heard in La Jolla area in 2007 or 8, I actually forgot the date, then all of a sudden the road collapsed. There was no rainfall. So what happens is when you have pipeline, sometimes what happens is when you have pipeline breaking in the landslide area somewhere in the uphill side, and then if the water from the pipeline will percolate down under the ground, you have no idea, even in the slope, 
the, it erodes the soil under the under the uh, the road or under the structure, and then the structure collapse. And in this case, the road collapse, and you could see landslide both sides uh, at the road. But the source of that is somehow the breakage of the. Uh, I mean, you can get typical these type of slides when there is a breakage in the water line. So you have to be extra careful. But because mo most of those water lines are buried underground, and you don't even notice whether there's a break uh, in the pipeline. You see the pressure in the water is pretty high, right? So uh, the mining, stone mining, and then after you do st stone quarrying or any type of mining, if you don't protect the slope, leave it there, then you're expecting landslide for sure. And that keeps on increasing. And water management, if you, you're just throwing your water wherever you want, then you're triggering problem, problem. Especially if your house is on the slope, and if you are not controlling water passes, uh, if you are not controlling the drainage of your water, then at some point you are inviting landslide. You have to be extra careful on that. Uh, the anthropocenic, I mean, bear with me if someone, some of you, you, you guys own this house. <laughs> it, it is, uh, in, if you drive Highway 91 uh, on the left side, and the, the names are there. So I'm not telling uh, this, uh, this house are uh, under the threat of landslide, or they, are, they, they may trigger. Um, there is a potential, right? I need to do investigation. I'm not doing that. But there is strong potential that these houses on top of the mountain will be affected by landslide. Because you can see the creek and the topography there. Big rainfall will definitely trigger landslide there. I haven't seen any prevention works below uh, those, uh, those houses there, right? So the problem is when, once you get landslide in that area because of poor water management or, or lack of awareness among the people, and then that creek will fill with debris mass and then see the houses, very beautiful houses you can see uh, at the bottom will be affected. So that is not the problem of the people who have houses in the downhill side. That is the problem of the people. Uh, you see, uh, the people in the uphill side, if they are triggering landslide, they may affect the people in the downhill side significantly. Right? So this is what happened in Montecito. Uh, so we, we see, we need to learn lesson from all these disasters. And if so, now Montecito, it occurred in Montecito, it may occur somewhere else. Right? In Orange County. So this is a type of you know landslide inventory we have in Highway Corridor 60. So I always urge the government to make uh, the, the inventory map of landslides in, in the area. That way, people are aware uh, that that area had landslide in the past. Otherwise, if I, I have no idea about landslide, those of you who have no idea about landslide, how would you know that your house was in landslide area? If you see the slope, beautiful, uh, you know, amazing, uh, you know, view from there, and the house was $3 million, and so all of a sudden, you, you got that for $750,000 or $800,000. They said, wow, I got a big deal. And you had no idea it was under landslide in the past. So if you have hazard map like that, or inventory of landslide like that, at least people can go and look into the inventory themselves. So uh, let me show you a few examples of landslides triggered. I'm skipping a little bit uh, with uh, the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. Like that, you see, the, the top left picture was uh, uh, before the earthquake. And then, the, during earthquake, it was an old landslide topography. During earthquake, the, due, due to the earthquake force, the landslide triggered and burned. You, see, you can see the debris mass at the building. And then, see the fortunate and unfortunate event here. If you look in the picture of the, uh, uh, this picture, did you see that blue uh, channel there? So what happened was earthquake, the landslide mass came down and bifurcated into two areas. So the houses immediately below that trigger, that source, was safe. The houses in the left and right got completely buried and lost people. Three people died in that incident. So you never know whether you, your area is safe or not. You have to you know, at least safeguard the, the entire area in that area, in, in, in that potential landslide area site. And then you can see the de debris mass, you see? The mass is so big that you know, th those cars were then kept pretty easily. I'll show you another example here. You see, the bottom picture is before the earthquake. So area had little potential to landslide, but you see, they had so many restaurants and, and the hotel in the area, uh, right immediately below the landslide mass. What happened was this. The source, you see, was if the, the ground in this side would have been weak, then that whole mass would come down and 
bury this buildings here, right? But the ground was strong somehow, and the ground in the left side was uh, uh, somehow weaker than the ground on the right side, and the landslide came down and then diverted to that area to kill 13 people there and bury over 20 buildings. So you never know. The exact same thing happened in Montecito. I'll show you a few pictures. So these, all those buildings got collapsed and the all cars got pancaked like that. Uh, all right, this building was safe, fortunately. The same thing happened, it's like, this is a typical picture I brought from 2011 to Hoku earthquake. Uh, to, um, I, I love to show this in Orange County because a lot of houses we have, a lot of housing developers we have, they cut the mountain, they use that dirt to fill in, so your most expensive houses you have in the mountain are in the field area, not in the cot area. Right? Because you don't want to buy a house in the court area and that will stop your view. Feel area, like even though you go to Beverly Hills, all those uh, expensive houses in the field area towards the, uh, the, the, the city. And if you don't do quality control in compacting that uh, field, then during earthquake what happens is when ground is shaking, the original ground and the field, uh, field ground, there's the separation between original ground and field. And then if you have house on that, for some reason, if the safety margin is low, that house slides down. And this is a typical example of that. Like that, your house is in the crack, and then houses collapse like this, you see, in that area. So, saying that, you have, you have to be extra careful. And it happened in Japan, right? But the situation is similar in Southern California. If you get earthquake, big earthquake, you may end up getting that. So, and then sometimes there's these landslides in Japan, these landslides completely block the river. But Japanese people are very sensitive. They, they went, even the people are so educated, all people went and community artificially bridged the national dam and they safeguarded the, the houses and bridges there, right? So, so if you look into the different scale, those Japanese landslides uh, triggered by earthquake were large in scale because they had volcanic ash. But if you look into the cases in Nepal, uh, I'm not going into feature of the, uh, the, this one, but you see, there's a landslide in general slope. What they did was they made houses at the coast, at the bank of the river, very soft soil. Uh, and then when you have an earthquake, soil is lo lost strength and the whole uh, ground moved. And you can see the houses like that. So uh, one house is just, you know, uh, tilted as at the crown of the landslide. There's another house. So houses got tilted and it, each house is about three and four thousand dollars. They got that. So like that, you see it's a source, the epicenter, and they got landslide in the area that completely, you know, uh, uh, damaged the buildings. Many landslides, they blocked the river like that, you see? And then you could see the, the boulders like that. Actually, you could see even smoke in the, the last picture. I was, I was just right there, maybe 30, 40 foot away from that smoke. It was even coming down. I ran away from that. Uh, but you see, a lot of cases, those landslides would bury the river, uh, right? So if we look into Montecito, this is a Thomas fire area. You know, it was in December, they were not even containing the fire, the rainfall came in, uh, in, in January 9th, uh, 8th, 9th, that huge rainfall came in. I was in, in Mexico that time, and I came uh, down and I went to the area. So see the Montecito area is, Montecito is all to the left, tiny corner of the fire, uh, uh, the Thomas Fire area, you see? It could trigger more damage in the other area, in the right side, but you see, fortunately, sometimes Mother Nature alerts you, uh, but does not save people. Uh, then, in this case, I thought, we lost a lot of properties, uh, but you see, the God saved us by triggering uh, debris flow at the end of the, the uh, debris flow, uh, the wildfire area. So, if you look, look into it, it's about, about half an inch of rainfall per minute, uh, uh, per hour, so can it, it, it's a mistake. Half an inch of rainfall per hour, uh, and then it's about 100 millimeter, over 100 millimeter of rainfall. Uh, then this is a, this is from uh, LA Times. So if you look into the Monte Montecito area, it got about 100 millimeter of uh, of rain, so about four inches of rain in a day, and then it triggered. And I did a little work on that. I checked. Did you see the the rainfall? The bar you can see are the rainfall per uh, per hour. You see? Uh, and then, you had little rainfall, all of a sudden that time, you got huge rainfall, and that triggered 
the, the debris flow. So if you fit that into the, the chart I showed you before, right? So then uh, you have, this is uh, the, the rainfall intensity they had and uh, the recorded in, in the device and there's the duration. So does that exactly fit into uh, uh, the line? And frankly speaking, it was expected. So we need to develop a forecasting system, forecast system in, into those, ho those hills just to protect people. You could see those creeks with debris. This is uh, the, the image after the wildfire. And this is the mass of the debris. This type of big boulders are still there. If you drive there, you can see all those debris. Are, I would say 80% of the debris are still there. The damage was done by 20% of the debris, right? So you see the mass, whole thing came down. And because it is uh, after the wildfire, the water is black color. Even that water is on the ocean, at least 500, 600 you know, yard uh, from the ocean, inside the ocean from the coast, you can still see that black color in the Google, or Google images. Like that, you see. And then you can see this in image. They have few debris uh, uh, you know, trap structures. That they, they call debris basin. But those basins were filled within 5, 10 minutes. And they're overflown and hit the community, you could see like that. And then now if you look into the picture, that big size debris coming and the trees, trees came down and then those trees blocked the river, right, blocked the, uh, the, uh, the bruises and then the, the debris overtopped and completely washed away bruises like that. And then you see this house was a little lucky because it was a little away from the bridge, but there was a bridge and this is the debris that you could see there. So like that, you see. The, this bridge was safe because what happened was the debris came in and the left side bank is a little higher uh, and I think they're almost equal and then the tree went and blocked uh, the, the culvert or bridge whatever you call it here and then because of the orientation of the tree the debris diverted in the, into the safe area so called safe area so then you see debris diverted to the right and then buried structures like that. This house was full of debris. They cleared that, right? So in some places you see, because of the debris mass, the pipeline broke and there was a fire. The gas pipeline broke and there was a fire. So you see, once you have these type of issues like that, you see the debris is all the way to the top, like that. You see the whole culverts were filled with debris and the trees. When you have tree, then that tree will block everything, wash everything away. And the last picture I brought here is still that so-called safe area and full of debris there. The full of those stones I could see, those big boulders I could see. So, I mean, yeah, fortunately, uh, I mean, unfortunately we had that incident, but fortunately the incidents I mean, could have been way bigger than what they had. Okay, now let me summarize a little bit saying that the precautions we have to take against landslides and mudslides is first we have to pay attention to all debris flow and landslide areas. Precipitation pattern, now we are lucky that we can get that way in advance. And geological, geomorphological, and geotechnical conditions in the area. We have to watch the past wildfire areas, and I would urge the government, if you have wildfire, pay attention to future, uh, you know, uh, through those wildfire areas, not to have debris flow and more slight disasters. And then water management, water management, water management. And design, for designers and planners, we have to pay attention to multiple factors right, uh, while planning and designing the infrastructure. Make landslide hazard map, right? The best thing is avoid the problem. If you know after the wildfire debris flow will come, you may lose property, but you don't, you, I, don't I mean, we don't want to lose our life, so we, we run away from that area. That is, so avoid the problem, at least for the time being. The best thing for you, uh, what I do is monitoring, monitoring. If you have a house, uh, very expensive or cheap, I didn't mind. But if you have a house on the slope, then if you see crack there, if you're worried about the landslide, then what you do is go there, go to Home Depot, buy sticks, right? Or if you, are, you have a crack on the concrete, buy two concrete nails. It doesn't cost you more than a dollar or two, right? And then in the stick, put a nail at the center of the stick, drive those sticks and buy a steel tip, big or small, steel tips, and then get the distance between those two sticks. Every morning before you go out for uh, your morning walk, get the distance between them. That you can do pretty easily. I, I used to teach this to almost everyone who had issue. At least three or four people a year, I'll teach that to escort them. 
right? These are the stakes like that, but you can simply put a stake there and then plot the distance between those two in x-axis and the time. You can take a graph paper and plot them and then you can see these type of trends. If, there is, if it is a landslide, then that distance keep on increasing with time. And if you're seeing it is moving, going up, then there's a danger, right? But if that distance is not increasing, they're flat, then it's not a landslide, that crack could be anything else. So you just seal the crack and don't let the water per per percolate from there, you are fine. Okay, now let me summarize that natural disasters are inevitable, but learning about those disasters help us to prepare against their consequences. So the important <laughs> thing is avoid the consequence of the disaster. And each country has the potential of specific type of uh, natural disaster, like we are in the area, we have wildfire every year. So we have strong more slide potential. So we just try to learn, uh, understand those disasters that will be triggered in our area, and, and then, uh, then avoid those problems as far as possible, or take precautionary measures. So we should learn lesson from the, uh, the disasters and then the change the guideline. This is for the government. If you are in council, uh, city council, or you, you have access to them, just tell them that. You see, we're, people, we're losing people. Uh, every year because of landslide, let's make hazard map in our city, in our county, and then alert people, because people don't know whether that's a vulnerable area. They look uh, into the house, amazing house, they just divide the, the price with the square footage and say, wow, I got $100 per square foot, amazing, very cheap, all right? And then you may end up having a disaster. So it's very important to take precautions for possible mudslides and landslides, especially uh, the, after the, the earthquake, uh, or those type of uh, other disasters. With this, it is uh, maybe one or two minutes over time, but I, uh, I want to conclude, and if you have any question, I will take them. I hope it was useful. Yeah. How many of our major arteries coming into Southern California are at risk because of these landslides or earthquakes? You know, I, I, I have no idea, but many of them are definitely at risk, especially when we lose vegetation cover. So we need to do investigation on that. But you see, our problem is whenever you get landslides and mudslides, and then you go and you tell there's a this, right? In 2014, we did a few uh, uh, analysis. We, did, we brought our students to uh, those, let's say, uh, the wildfire area. We had debris flow after that. And we found almost all creeks were in, in, in at risk. So many creeks we have. We have boulders deposited. Somehow they, those boulders are there in geological, geological history. Uh, and then they are at the marginal situation. So if you have big rainfall, uh, then if that rainwater is enough to percolate down and dislodge them from the, the mountain, and then they would definitely go to creek and block them. So I think it is important for the government to look into it. Um, yes, from our side, as is, uh, using our students, our resources, we can do uh, a little research on that. I'm, I'm working on the Montecito. Okay? I, I mean, it was disheartening. When you go there and see people uh, you know, uh, spending multi-million dollars to buy the houses there, and then losing the houses, right? Mostly when you have landslide, government does not, I mean, the insurance doesn't have too much, as you are expecting, unless you have amazing insurance. So uh, it, it is disheartening. So, uh, uh, then I'm working with my students now to see uh, how we can reduce uh, the problem in the post wildfire area in, in Southern California. Uh, but I think it should come from the government scale to see, uh, you know, how many, uh, you know, those uh, those artists we have are vulnerable to slides. Does this make sense? Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, you know, insurance companies call. Uh, cover damage by landslides that are not related to earthquakes? You see, for landslide, based on what I have seen so far, is you need to get special uh, insurance. And then when it is natural, you have to look into it. When that is mainly natural disaster, right? And a lot of times when you have natural disaster, it doesn't cover. You're, covered. You're not. Yeah. So typically, landslide insurance are very expensive first. Uh, and then you have to look into uh, those uh, contract documents. So it's really tricky uh, to uh, get landslide insurance. But I personally think that in Southern California, we have to make the insurance system 
uh, for the houses uh, against landslides. Uh, uh, I mean, some, some, some people, they have houses in Malibu. I have seen that few houses in Malibu. They put heavy amount of money uh, for the landslide insurance. And then you need to have, you need to be qualified. Most of the time, you see, they said, um, I heard uh, from a few people that uh, most of the time, if it says uh, that was due to natural disaster, and then how do you know whether it is due to natural, on, I mean, whether the disaster is unprecedented or not? Right, so it's a little, little trick. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.